<laughs> so we left off last time, uh, we talked about rule-based classifiers. I think I'm way forward here on the, okay. And we finished up and we said, uh, The, today we were going to talk about or introduce Bayesian classifiers and uh, the Bayesian classifiers are based on uh, some ideas developed by Thomas Bayes, uh, his theorem, so James, you for example, we uh, talked about Bayes' theorems or you had a test about Bayes' theorem in probability and statistics yesterday. I got that problem wrong. Um, <laughs> we're gonna, right. But it's going to be, it, the first approach, there's actually going to be a couple of implementations we're going to look at in terms of Bayesian classifiers. And, <clears throat> uh, but basically we're going to use Bayes' theorem to try to build some probabilistic models of relationships between the attributes and the classes. Um, and, and the idea is we're going to, it's our first real probabilistic methods for classification. And, and essentially, uh, we're going to have some prior class knowledge, basically a distribution of what the final classes are from the training set, but we're going to update those, um, those probabilities use, using information from the attributes. Uh, in, in various ways. And so the two implementations I'm going to begin discussing at first at least. The first one's called naive Bayes, sometimes also called simple Bayes, um, and we'll see why it's called that. Uh, Bayesian uh, classifiers, before we even begin, it requires the, a concept called conditional probability. So everyone should have at least some rough idea of probability. Um, but the idea of a conditional probability is given additional information that the, inf the additional information can actually change the probability. So an example of this might be rolling two dice. And if you think about the, all the possibilities, the first die can, has one of six possibilities, the second die also has one of six possibilities. So as a pair, you end up with 36 distinct possibilities. Now, of those uh, possibilities, um, there are, we can talk about the number of ways to get a sum of, say, six. And it ends up that there are exactly five ways to get a sum of six. One and five, two and four, three and three, four and two, five and one. Fair enough? But what about if I rolled the dice and I actually looked at the two dice and now told you that one of the one of the dice was a two. Okay. Is, is the problem clear? So I've given you additional information. And once you have that additional information, it's going to change the possibility or the, the actual probability for getting a sum of sex. In fact, let's, uh, let's move over to the whiteboard to try to take a look at that. So <clears throat> I can start listing all the possibilities I'll use, and I know um, I have to write all of these and press return. But if I know that at least that 
Did I say at least one of the die is a two, or? You yeah. said one die is two. One die is a two? Yeah. Exactly one? No, you it, it does matter. Yeah. You just said one die, you didn't say which. One. So one, one and one. In, uh, It could be the other well, one. We don't, one. yeah, we don't at know least what the one. other one is, right? So it could be a two as well? Yeah. Right. So I'm going to list on the screen here. So in Florida, I'll, I'll press return when I'm done listing all the possibilities. That should be that should be it. And if you count all of the possibilities, you notice that there are eleven possibilities, right? Can, can, or is that too small? That might be too too small. So um, can I increase the font after the fact? Oh wait, I have a have a you hand have there. You have to hit no on the oh, there. Yeah, I'm gonna. No, you gotta hit. Well, you have to hit no first. Or yes, yes. doesn't matter. Cannot see your whiteboard. Okay. Do you share desktop and do Microsoft Word? Maybe? Yeah, I'm going to do that. No, no you just okay. want to share. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do it in, uh, in Word. So, um, <clears throat> and I'll make sure that I still see the hand in case it goes up. So I'll, I'll write it here and let's do it size 24. That should be big enough. So 2 comma 1, 2 comma 2, 2 comma Here. So we have 11 possible cases, and now we can actually look to see of those 11 possible cases, we have exactly two. So two, four. And let's see if I can. And four, two. Of those particular cases, that add up to six. So once I mention that at least one of the two dice is a two, we actually now have a probability that the sum is six of two elevenths instead of five thirty-sixths. So that additional information, anytime you have additional information, you can update your probabilities. So I'll go back here. And our mic is off. There mic. No one is red, they can turn it on. Were you able to see? Yeah, not yet, but the way we are you. Right. Uh, you are now still in your desktop. Maybe have to wait for a minute. 
Did you see it when I did it in, in Word there? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. You're, you're coming in loud and clear now. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, conditional probability. And so it measures the probability of an event uh, given some additional information, uh, evidence that another event has occurred. And this, in the example I gave, we tossed the dice and I mentioned now you have additional information and that allows you to update your prior information. I'm going to be using these, uh, that word as we move forward, um, prior to a posterior probability. So that the updated probability we'll call the pro posterior probability. Uh, the notation we're going to use uh, is uh, on the board here. It's probability of A, and, and we have that vertical line. That vertical line means given that or knowing that B happened. So in this example, the probability that A of A, knowing that B happened, um, you can calculate that in, in the way we did it, and, and, but it comes out to be um, the probability of both A and B happening divided by the probability that B happens to begin with. Um, and equivalently, we have the formula down at the bottom that uh, this is probably the most math heavy uh, lecture um, section that we'll deal with at least for a while. So uh, bear with me. Um, I don't know. I know that not everyone here in Alamosa has seen a lot of probability. Is that an accurate assessment, Drew? I've yeah, seen some. Um, you've seen some, but I know not everyone has, so I'm, I'm going to try to walk you through this. Um, probably the same in Florida. Uh, uh, three out of the four, that's the probability that we get one, only got it in high school. Okay. So I'll, I'm going to try to gauge it to that. Um, so the idea here, another way of writing this, uh, as, long as, a, as long as the probability of the, the uh, first event B didn't happen, or is not zero, um, is that the probability of a happening and B happening, the intersection, can be given with as the probability that B happened times that conditional probability that A happens uh, given that B did happen. So I'm going to go through an example of uh, some uh, conditional probabilities. And at the end, we'll go through an example of exactly how Bayes' theorem works. So the example I'm going to use, suppose we have a specific population. We know that overall, 1% of that population has a particular form of cancer. And a new diagnostic test has been developed to uh, try to uh, catch the cancer, to try to um, tell if somebody has it. And it's going to correct, it produces a correct positive result if you actually, notice that if that I just said there, if someone actually has the cancer, the test will correctly detect the cancer 99% of the time. But that if statement, that 99% of the time, the probability 0.99, is a conditional probability because it depends on a person actually having the cancer. Okay. <clears throat> the test also will correctly give a negative result for those without the cancer 98% of the time. I'm going to have a diagram on the next slide that, that shows this. That's again a conditional probability. That 0.98, 98% 
is not 0.98 of the general population, of that specific population. It's only a probability 0.98 of the people who don't have the cancer. 1%, so the probability of cancer is on the, the uh, bullet point, uh, the probability of cancer is 0 0.01, that's 1% of the specific population has a cancer. And notice, um, whoops, I did make a mistake on this slide. That should be the probability of a positive test given cancer is 0.99. So the, um, so these two, and I think I did that on, the, on both of the bottom two here. Um, let me uh, share, and, and I'll write it in, in words so that, uh, or, or is that clear in Florida what it should be? So the positive test should be on the left, the cancer should be on the right. And on the last statement, the negative test should be on the left and the no cancer should be on the right. Is that clear to everyone? Mm -hmm. So in fact, I'll make that clear on, in the next slide here. Uh, oh, the, the following slide, I think. Or, well, coming up. Um, we have another two questions. Oh, those are the same two, okay. Uh, moving on. So we know that if you have the cancer, right, then the probability that you'll test positive is 0.99. If you don't have the cancer, the probability you'll test negative is 0.98. But that's not always what you're interested in. What you're really interested in um, is say Katie goes to get tested. I'm not trying to pick on you, but, and she tests positive, okay? Does that mean that there, there is a really good likelihood that she has the cancer? Well, that's going to depend. And how do we find that probability? That's where Bayes' theorem is going to be very useful for us. So one thing that Bayes' theorem does is it's going to reverse the process to provide us with an answer. Um, I have the whole, up at the top here is the derivation. Um, the probability of B given A, the reverse of what I have, is related to the probability of A given B um, through the final statement at the bottom there of the first bullet point. And, and that's the key, and, and we're going to keep coming back to this, but again, I'm going to go through the, di I think the diagram that I'm going to give you which is now on the next slide, because I see the, the numbers here, is actually going to make it clearer. I'm going to use a tree diagram. But basically, if we follow through everything here, the probability of cancer giving a positive test is the probability of a positive test given cancer times can probability of cancer over the probability of a positive test. And it ends up in with these numbers, Katie, that even though you tested positive, you still only have a 1% chance that you have the cancer. So let's see how that works in um, more detail. The uh, actual, I had some paths circled here, but they didn't come out on the slide. Um, as shown here, they shown on my computer, but the, the, the fact that you tested positive means that you ended up, can I write on, yeah, on this, your pen. 
It's still, I don't know, you see the little go up? No, no, left. You see the little pen above the mic? Ah, there we go. So, um, here's the pencil. Let's do it in green. That's not green. Click on the pen. There you go. Now it's still writing in black. Why well, it's not writing at all. So here's one possibility for testing positive. Is that showing up in uh, Florida? I think we have a little type O in the next uh, path in the tree. When no cancer has the positive, it's point to zero two. Oh, those are switched. Range. Those should be yeah. those should be switched. Okay. Yeah. And then the other the other uh, possibility, you know, that you ended up on one of these two paths down here. Uh, no, technically the number is right where it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, so I want to clear the mark up because I screwed that up there. Uh, do you still have the pencil? Yeah. So we we tested positive. So either I have the cancer and tested. It, Posti tested positive, or Katie does not have the cancer and still tests positive. And no, he's right. These numbers, this should be 0 0.02 here. Right? And this should be the 0.98 down here. It was just saying that you could also swap the words. That's we could also that. swap the words. Okay, so I know I ended up either either way. I ended up at the end of those two branches, and the the fraction of the time that I act, that Katie actually ends up having cancer ends up being 0 0.01 times 0.99 over the total of the possibilities for. Uh, testing positive, and I think that that actually ends up higher than 1%, but it's still fairly low. It's 0 0.01 times 0 0.99 in the denominator over 0 0.99 times 0 0.02. Okay. Hopefully everyone's still... Cody? You good? Drew? Drew, is this making sense to you? James? I like the trees. Yeah, I see it better with the trees. You see it better with the trees? Yeah. Okay. That's why I do that. Um, what happened there? I must have started the other... I think I updated a new one. Ah. There we go. Okay, so we went through that. Oh, that's, there it is. There's, there's the one with the picture I had. The numbers are still wrong. Okay. So now we're going to try to take this idea of Bayes' theorem uh, and apply it to classification. Okay, so I want to make sure before we be begin that everyone's reasonably okay with Bayes' theorem. So here's our interpretation that we're going to use for application to classification. We're going to uh, notice we have that conditional probability. We're going to get that the probability of being in a particular class, C, given the values of our attributes, so our, our, or features. Our features are F1, F2, up through Fn. So we have the values for our features, and we want to then classify it in different classes. And so we're going to calculate the probability of being in a class C given the values of the features. And in order to do that, we're going to use the rewriting of the formula 
to say that that's equal to the probability of being in class C times the probability of having those features knowing we're in class C. So that's that reversal process that Bayes' theorem does for us, divided by the probability of having those values for our features. So that's the math part here. An easy way to, to describe that um, is to talk about that there are new posterior probability or updated probability is equal to our prior probability, which is just given by the distribution of our classes, times the likelihood of having those feet values for our features, and we some given that particular class, and we I'll talk about divided by the probability of having that evidence, which is the probability of our features. All of that divided by the, the evidence is just the likelihood. So the posterior is a prior, it doesn't matter. It's multiplication followed by division. True. <laughs> okay, so it's a prior times the likelihood divided by the evidence. So some uh, again I said this is heavy, this is kind of heavy math. We'll go through a really um, uh, an example that hopefully makes all this clear. So the key concepts here. If we go back, notice that that evidence is completely independent of the class. Notice this division on the bottom is the probability of obtaining feature one, feature two, mm -hmm. up through feature values for each of the features. There's no dependency there on the class that you're looking at. So, in essence, in terms of in terms of everything, that denominator is constant. We have the values we have for our sample, so it's fixed regardless of which class we're looking at. Okay. Uh, this is a heavy statement if you've not seen probabilities, but the numerator is equivalent to a joint probability model, which means the probability that C happens and feature one happen has its value, and, the pro and feature two has the value that it obtains that all the features obtain have the values they obtain. So there's a probability of all of that happening. Here's where the term naive Bayes comes from. We're going to make a very naive or simple assumption that everything breaks apart. That all the features uh, their probabilities of, of all the features are independent of each other, and the only thing they're going to depend on is the class. The probability is oh, the probability of obtaining feature one is only going to depend on the class, not be intertwined with any of the other features. Okay. So hopefully. Bear with me, as we get to an example, this should become uh, clearer. Good so far, James? Florida? Well, the answer is the kind of thing that happens if they have taken what they did before. It's pretty hard for Right, that's why I'm going to go through an example. And hopefully it comes, uh, I, I, I'm very aware of that. So, so at this point, there are multiple versions of Naive Bayes. And Naive Bayes is built into Weka, And you can um, specify different uh, parameters here. But um, in order to use Naive Bayes, we're going to have to make some 
assumption about the distribution, the probability distribution underlying um, that we're going to use. So some, some typical ones that you might use are the Gaussian distribution, also called the normal distribution. That's the one we're actually going to look at in our example. Um, and that's usually used for continuous data. Uh, we're going to be looking at values for our attributes of, of uh, height and weight and, and foot size, which tend to be in inches, so length, um, are going to be continuous values. But some other assumptions you could make are multinomial, um, where you can put it into different, num different bins. One thing happens, or another thing happens, or a third thing happens, or a fourth thing happens. And Bernoulli, which is when two things happen. So here's an example. This one's from Wikipedia page on, on uh, Bay Naive Bayes. Um, so, Here's our training set. It consists of eight instances, right? And so you've got four males and four females, and we've got their heights listed, we've got their weights listed, and we've got their foot size in inches listed. Good enough? Pretty reasonable? Um, and what we're going to do, ultimately, we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna have at the end of this a new sample. And we're going to try to classify that sample as either male or female. So first we need to build a model. So we're going to have to make some assumptions. First, we're looking at continuous data, height and weight and length. Um, so a, a good model here might be to use a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. Um, the curve is defined, it's a probability density, I'm not expecting people to know that, but it's going to look like this curve right there. Who, has everyone at least seen a normal distribution? <coughs> yeah. Know what the curve looks like? Okay, let's see if the whiteboard works. Should I try it? Where's the, share? There. Um, yeah. That's what I thought, but I, so it basically looks like it's a bell curve. Hopefully I get that reasonably well. Does that look familiar, James? Somewhat? <clears throat> the center of the data right here that would be your mean right there. So your average. Would be right in the center. It's symmetric. It goes on. Have you seen a curve like that? Bell curve is another name for it. Okay. And the standard deviation at this this picture is not very good, but the standard deviation is related to the inflect is exactly one standard deviation from the mean is exactly where an inflection point where it goes from concave down to concave up happens. Okay, so we'll let's see. How do we Go back. Go back to the yeah. yeah. Go to slide. There we go. Could it be going down phase one? Okay, so that's. Okay, so, and the other, other assumption we're going to make at this point uh, is that the probability of male is the same as the probability of female is 
It might be wrong. We can have other values there, but that's going to be our assumption, equally likely split between the two. So the first thing we're going to do uh, is generate some information, consolidate the information here about each of the two uh, classes, male and female. And in fact, if I averaged the height of each, we got 5.855 feet for male, 5.4175 feet for exactly female. Average. Pardon? Not exactly average. Um, 5.8. So it's higher than that. 5.8 would be two thirds, 5.66 feet. Um, height variance, everyone familiar with variance? Standard deviation? James? So you've seen standard deviation and how to calculate it? Excel will calculate it too. But. Um, the variance is the square of the standard deviation. And these are sample uh, variances because we have a sample of size A. So we have a, a variance of the height for male and female. We've got the mean for the weight of male and female. So our features are height, weight, and foot size. Um, we've got the variance for the weight. We've got the foot size in inches for male and female along with the variances. You good? So if we go back. Hello? Yes? The weight? Yes? Yeah, the weight of female must be 55. That means they're like, what's the square root of 600? Well, I think, don't forget, this is variance, not standard deviation. Oh, variance? Okay. So it's a square of the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is about 24 pounds for the female. I thought the same thing when I was going through this. I'm like, that seems awfully high, but then I forgot you have to take the square root. So it's like, 12. so male is pretty, so for like, yeah, for male it's like 11 pounds. 11 pounds for the males. Okay. Mm -hmm. For the males it's like 22-ish. Right, 22-ish okay. for the females. Yeah, it seemed awfully high and then I... Actually, twins. So here, so then we get a new sample in, right? Okay. And we want to classify, is this male or female. Here's the information. The height is six feet. That would indicate more on the male side, right? Uh, the weight, though, is 130. So that's way on the female side. And the foot size is eight, which if you looked at the... Uh, eight inches. Not size eight, it's an eight inches. Um, that's also leaning towards the female size. So it's two out of three. Well, yeah, but it's not quite that straightforward. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the model here, this sig uh, in the bottom sigma square here, that is the variance. Um, X is going to be the value of our sample, the, the mean here, mu is, that Greek letter mu, is our mean for each, uh, for each of the features. And we're going to use this on each of the features and then uh, tie everything together using the naive independence assumptions to calculate the probabilities or the important part of the probability for being male versus female. So that's kind of where we're headed. We're probably not going to finish it today, um, but 
So, but that's our, that's where we want to do. We're going to want to calculate, given this information, this sample point, what are our posterior probabilities of being male and our posterior probabilities of being female given all of this evidence. Um, and so, and, and the values of the features, uh, I have the formulas for posterior male and posterior female up here. We're going to end up not, this evidence is constant, it's in both of them, so we're just going to calculate the numerators of these calculations. And whichever one is larger is the one that we're going to choose to classify this particular sample as being. So hopefully I haven't gone too fast over this. Um, I'm going to leave it there because um, it's going to take a while to go through the rest of this. And um, I can pick up with this example, repeating some of what we talked about. Again, I realize this is pretty heavy duty yeah, math. math here. Pretty so, pardon? It's probably pretty new for some people. And pretty new to a lot of people. So I expect questions uh, on Friday um, and as we go through this. The other thing I should mention is homework. That's, there's an assignment on the web for next Wednesday. There is an assignment due today. And I want to...